WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Good evening. I'm Thomas Freed, the author of The Simple Truth About Income Tax, and also the author and webmaster of the TaxFreedom.com and IRSZoom.com websites. And this is the Truth Attack Hour on the Liberty Works Radio Network. Okay. We've been talking on this show the last few weeks about the federal personal income tax. And two weeks ago, before we were interrupted by the weather last week, which made it impossible to put the show on, I promised that this week I would get to explaining how that tax finally reached in law the wages of the citizens under Subtitle C and the employment tax laws that were enacted after 1945. But before we get to that, I want to briefly go over and review what we identified about that um, personal income tax that was imposed in 1913 in the Subtitle A Code section, which is substantially different from the Subtitle C Code of 1945, and specifically what the Supreme Court said about that tax under the new 16th Amendment, because Everybody in this country can pretty much tell you that the income tax is constitutional, and then they don't want to have a discussion about it. And my feeling is it's a lot more important to know not that it is constitutional, but why the court said that. I mean, is it constitutional as a direct tax without apportionment, which is what everybody believes and which is how the IRS currently enforces the tax? Or is it constitutional because the Supreme Court specifically said it is not a direct tax without apportionment, uh, but rather is an indirect tax or something else? I mean, is it sufficient to just know that the tax is constitutional, or isn't it important to know why that is true? And I like to point out that what the court found in 1916 when it ruled and tested this legislation is it specifically held that the income tax authorized under the 16th Amendment is not a direct tax without apportionment. It is not a direct tax simply because the amendment authorizes it to be without apportionment. The 16th Amendment doesn't actually contain the word direct in describing the tax that is authorized under the amendment. So while the tax is without apportionment, under the wording of the amendment, as a tax without apportionment, it then cannot be direct, because that application of the tax is still prohibited under the unrepealed and unamended provisions of Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, and Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4 of the Constitution, which require that all direct taxes be apportioned to the states for collection, and that all direct taxes be laid in proportion to the census. So the court specifically ruled it is not a direct tax without apportionment, but is an indirect tax. And they held that this indirect tax is imposed under the legislation that they were testing, which, by the way, was tariff legislation, the Underwood-Simmons Tariff Act of 1913, of October 3rd, 1913. They held that this legislation they were testing specifically was not an indirect tax, not only because the 16th Amendment couldn't authorize a tax on income as a direct tax without apportionment, but also because the legislation they were testing didn't lay the tax that way and didn't authorize it to be collected in that direct manner. They specifically noted that the legislation they were testing in 1913 as to, to, determine, the income, to determine the constitutionality of the tax They specifically noted that this legislation implemented an indirect scheme of collection of the tax at the source, where the only person who is made liable for the payment of the tax is the person who collects it by withholding the tax from a taxable payment. And the analogy that I made in describing this is the same way that a store is made liable for the collection and the payment of a state's sales tax, 
so too is the payor of taxable income made liable for the withholding, collection, and payment of the federal income tax under the legislation that was tested. And that legislation, that implemented scheme of uh, collecting the tax at the source by having the payor withhold the tax, is extended into the Subtitle C Code where we have the employer who acts as the tax collector, who appears to be required by the law to withhold and collect the tax, and then is the party made liable in Subtitle C for the payment of that tax. But that employer didn't exist in law until the Subtitle C tax code came about in 1945. So the question becomes, who was the tax collector in 1913? How was that statutorily defined? And what authority did the court see when it tested that? And what we've seen in law is that collect authority to collect the tax before 1945 in the employment tax laws was limited to an authority of a party identified in law as a withholding agent who is only required to deduct and withhold the tax from payments made to non-resident aliens. And I explain that the reason why the withholding agent is only authorized to collect the tax in Subtitle A under the 1913 legislation, only authorized to withhold from non-resident aliens, because it's a tariff act. And the tariff only reaches the earnings and income and activity of foreign persons conducting activity in the U.S. or of U.S. citizens operating in foreign countries under tax treaties or territories and possessions at the time in 1913. So that's why citizens, basically, if you ask anyone who's old enough to remember back that far at this point, whether or not they filed Form 1040s before World War II or paid tax on any of their earnings or income before World War II, they'll tell you, no, they didn't, because this tax did not reach the body of the population until World War II. It was a tax that was collected primarily from foreigners, and the court also identified in this initial controlling legislation, these original test cases, Bruce Schaber and Baltic Mining, so Bruce Schaber versus Union Pacific Railroad and Stanton versus Baltic Mining, they identified that the taxes imposed in this 1913 legislation that they're testing, both as this indirect duty to collect the tax from transaction with foreign persons and as a duty of the corporations to pay tax on the profits derived from their earnings. And the tax on the corporations was imposed as an indirect excise, which is defined by the court as taxes on um, manufacture, consumption, and sale of commodities within the country, on licenses to pursue certain occupations, and upon corporate privileges. And the basis of the tax on the corporate income is the fact that the corporation exists only by virtue of the privilege granted to it by the federal government to exist as a uh, paper shell. So all of the earnings of the corporations are subject to a tax on their income as an indirect excise because the earnings are not derived from any exercise of an inherent right to work, but are only enjoyed as a result of the privilege granted to them by the federal government. It's the privilege that becomes the basis of the tax for the income on the, of the corporations. But citizens don't earn money by virtue of any federally granted privilege, unless they hold like a license for alcohol, tobacco, or firearms or something. But under normal occupation, the common right, citizens are not involved with any federally granted privilege, and that's why this body of law in Subtitle A never got around to reaching or touching the wages or earnings of citizens um, previous to 1945. And again, we see that in the law, wherein under Section 1441B, we plainly see that the wages of non-resident aliens are made subject to the withholding and collection of the tax by the withholding agents. But nowhere in Subtitle A, including Section 1, where the rate of tax is imposed, and Section 61, where gross income is defined, nowhere in any part of Subtitle A is the term wages contained 
other than in this 1441B, where it's the wages of the non-resident alien that are made subject to the tax by mandatory command to withhold it as a withholding agent and then make payment of it. It's not just interest, dividends, and other sources. It's the wages are also included. And this surprises us a lot of attorneys to learn that wages actually do appear in Subtitle A, because most attorneys will tell you that wages don't appear in tax law until Subtitle C, but that's not correct. The wages of the non-resident alien are taxed in Subtitle A, no other party's wages are taxed, and we're going to get to what happens in Subtitle C in a moment. So what you find is, and, and all of this is confirmed for us in Treasury Decision 2313, which was issued by the Treasury Department in 1916, right after the Bruchaber decision, and it is instructions from the Treasury Department to the employees um, of the Internal Revenue Service, its predecessor agency, on how to uh, implement and enforce the new income tax under the decision from Bruchaber. And in that Treasury Decision 2013, it's clearly stated that it's non-resident aliens that are liable for the tax on all of their earnings. And it says nothing about citizens being made liable for that. That they've just allowed people to assume without it ever being stated in law. So nowhere in Subtitle A do we specifically have the wages of a citizen made subject to the tax. And, of course, the reason why is because wages are not profit. Wages are earnings. And behind the earnings of almost everything, there is a basis that needs to be ducted out. Everything that you, I mean, your work has, a, has an inherent value to it. And that inherent value is the basis, which, according to the government, is zero. You don't get to deduct any basis against your earnings. Every single penny that comes in is profit, income, subject to tax. This takes from you your right to work and makes the exercise of it subject to this tax. But the Constitution prohibits rights from being taxed, and this is why the original legislation in 1913 didn't tax the wages of citizens, because it would be a direct tax on earnings rather than on simple profits, and um, they understood that probably wouldn't withstand the testing of the court. So they very carefully wrote limited legislation in 1913 that only implemented this income tax as a duty of the tax collector to withhold, collect, and pay over what has been collected. And the only liability that exists in statute for the Subtitle A tax enacted in 1913 is the liability of the tax collector the same way that the only liability that exists in law for the payment of a sales tax is the liability that exists in the name of the store as the party subject to the duty to collect and pay the tax. And just like when the store fails the duty to administer to the collection of the tax, the government doesn't go to the store and say, give us the name and number an address of the last 100,000 customers you did business with so we can go get the eight cents they owe, which of course would bankrupt the state to pursue that. They tell the store that as the collector, it is now responsible for the payment of the tax. Not because that's how the tax is imposed, but because that's the penalty for failing to the duty to collect it and exercise your right to shift the burden from their pocket as a store to the pocket of their customers who they are allowed to raise the price on in order to collect the tax from, in order to pay it to the government. So having failed to exercise the right to shift the burden, they are now responsible for the payment of the tax, and that way the state can easily pursue collection and enforcement of the tax from a single party rather than 100000 And when we study the federal income tax law, we find we have exactly the same indirect scheme of collection with exactly the same limited placement of statutory liability, with exactly the same lack of any application of penalty or payment beyond that owed by the collector. There is no passing through the collector to create an underlying liability of the person making the earnings. Okay, we're coming up on a break here. That's enough, I think, in review. In the next section, we're going to go ahead and address what happened in 1944 and 1945.
And this is Thomas Freed on the Truth Attack Hour on Liberty Works Radio Network. We'll be back. Okay, we're back. This is Thomas Freed on the Liberty Works Radio Network. This is the Truth Attack Hour. And we're going to continue now with our examination of the income tax laws. Uh, as we get to the employment tax laws of 1944, again, I'd like to point out that previous to this point in time, the federal income tax laws didn't reach the majority of the population, which had, of course, no activity in foreign countries under tax treaty or in territories or possessions, nor did they operate as corporations. These were all activities that were pretty much, not exclusively, but dominantly the domain of the wealthy. And it was they who had to pay taxes on those activities, not everything that they earned. Now, again, the government has from the beginning encouraged a misapplication of the law, so, of course, any citizen who in that period misapplied the tax law to his own earnings and income, where it was earned domestically, was, of course, allowed to do that by the government. So, but the tax did not reach most American citizens previous to World War II. And, of course, during World War II, the Americans were called to essentially, uh, you know, save the planet. And the American people were had to by themselves, uh, essentially, uh, in both the European and Pacific theaters, defeat both the Germans and the Japanese. Now, I suppose that uh, most of the European allies would complain about that analysis of it, but let's face it, it was the American forces that turned the tide and won that war, and we didn't get any help in the uh, Japanese theater to speak of. So. That, of course, took a huge wave of patriotism, and the Americans stood up and uh, met the call. At, at the time, there was a huge wave of patriotic fervor that swept through the nation, necessary to accomplish those feats at time of war, and the American people did it. But uh, it, as a result, of course, national debt was run up. And I'm not positive about this year, but I think in 1942, the federal government passed what's known as the Victory Tax. And the victory tax was written as a separate piece of legislation, and I, I think it was written as a separate piece of legislation because they suspected somebody would complain. Uh, the victory tax was a tax for the first time that touched the wages of all citizens at the source of the employers and commanded that a certain amount be taken from everyone to pay down the war, war debt. And this, of course, was a direct application of the taxing powers. And I suspect the federal government figured that somebody would complain about the constitutionality of the tax, but they wrote it to only last as long as there was debt from the war to be repaid. And within three years, that debt was all paid off by this tax, and so it fell off the books. And lo and behold, nobody had complained. No one had complained. It had been in place for three years as a direct tax, and no one in America, because, of course, if you complain, you are an unpatriotic Nazi or Japanese sympathizer. So uh, but the government, I'm sure, was simply amazed that no one complained, and they decided that we can't allow this to go away. So they enacted what is now called the Current Tax Withholding Act. It was enacted in 1945. It is the legislation that we are under today. And it was the follow-on legislation to the victory tax, and that legislation has been codified in law as subtitle C of the United States Code, Title 26. That's the body of tax law we all know as employment taxes. And what I'm going to do right now is we're going to look at what these employment taxes really do and how they operate, because, of course, this is where the income tax has come to reach the wages of the American citizens and earnings. This is the body of law through which that has been affected. It isn't there in the Subtitle A Code, even though that's what the government wrongfully and erroneously relies on today to prosecute people. But the record of all of your earnings comes out of this Subtitle C Employment Tax Law, and that's what they rely on to enforce the tax imposed in Subtitle A on the non-resident aliens wages, but not on the citizens. So what we're going to do is examine the Subtitle C Employment Tax Law and see what we see here. Now, the first thing we notice is that in Subtitle C, 
there are only some, uh, what, six chapters. Chapter 21, chapter 22, 23, 23A, 24, and 25. That's it. Now, Chapter 21 is Federal Insurance Contributions Act. It consists of sections 3101 through 3128, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on these other chapters, but I want to go through them so that you understand the structure and the inherent contradictions in how this tax is imposed. In Chapter 21, which is the Federal Insurance Contributions Act, or FICA, that's the Social Security tax, Section 3101 is the first code section in that chapter. And in it, we see that there is a rate of tax imposed on the employee. And that's the employee's half of the Social Security tax. And then in Section 3111, we see that there is a tax imposed on the employer, and that's the employer's half of the FICA tax. But what we see in 3111 is that the language explicitly states that it is an excise tax that is imposed on the employer. And that language is left out of 3101, where it's just a tax on the employee. So what they're inferring here is that the same tax is a direct tax on the employee without apportionment. And on the employer, it's an indirect excise tax, which makes this tax both a direct tax and indirect tax at the same time, which is constitutionally impossible. No tax can be both. Every tax has to be one or the other. The tax is either direct, where it's apportioned to the states, or it's indirect, where it's uniform. No tax can be both. But here it is in Chapter 21, a tax that specifically declares itself to be both. Okay. Chapter 22, the Railroad Retirement Act. There's a special chapter for this because the railroad people in the 1930s already had their own retirement program set up when Social Security was put in place, and they didn't think they should have to do two programs. Congress agreed, so they wrote this separate stuff addressing the Railroad Retirement Act. And here, under Section 3201, again, we have the employee, a rate of tax imposed on the employee's pay, and that's the employee's half. And then under 3221, we find that the employer has the rate of tax imposed as his half. But again, in 3221, it explicitly labels the tax as an excise imposed on the employer. So everywhere the tax is imposed on the corporation, it's specifically identified in law as an indirect excise. And where it's imposed on the employee, that specific identification and designation is not present in the written law in order to deceive you as to the true nature of the tax. Okay, Chapter 23, FUTA, the unemployment tax, federal unemployment tax. In Chapter 23, we find that Section 3301, the first code section in the chapter, is again a tax on an employer. There is no unemployment tax on the citizen. And this employer tax is again specifically identified in the statute, 3301, as being an excise tax, which of course makes it indirect. And in Chapter 23A, the railroad unemployment, Section 3321 employs is, again, it says specifically, an excise tax on the employer. So what we have in these first four chapters of Subtitle C, the Employment Tax Law, is everywhere we look we see that the tax is employed on the employee without specification of the type, and it's employed, it, it, it is imposed on the employer with a specific specification that it is an excise tax being imposed. So. If you happen to know that a tax can't be both direct and indirect, this has to raise an awful lot of questions. But these are just the Social Security tax, the unemployment tax, and, of course, the railroad taxes, which don't affect most people anymore. What we really want to look at is the next chapter, Chapter 24, Collection of Tax at Source on Wages. And this is the code section, and this is the chapter where the income tax is authorized to be collected from the wages of citizens. And that's what we're going to look at right now. Now, the first thing that we notice about this chapter is that first code section here is 3401. And unlike all the other chapters, where the first code section in the chapter, like 3101 and for FICA, and 3201 for the railroad retirement, and 3301 for the food tax, unlike all the other chapters where the first code section in the chapter is a tax imposed, 
In chapter 24, the first section, 3401, is definitions. There is no tax imposed in section 3401, the first code section. It just lists off the definitions for terms used in the subtitle C, tax law, things like what an employer is, what an employee is, what wages are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there is no tax imposed. It simply sets up the definitions to be used. Now, the next thing we know, notice, is the next code section, Chapter 3402, is income tax collected at source. And I'm going to read that to you real quick because it's short. A, income tax collected at source. This is check, uh, uh, Section 3402 from Subtitle C of Title 26, the tax code, IRC. Income tax collected at source. A, requirement of withholding. One, in general. Except, as otherwise provided in the section, every employer making payment of wages shall deduct and withhold upon such wages a tax determined in accordance with the tables or computational procedures prescribed by the secretary. Okay, now, now what that does is it authorizes employers making payment of wages to deduct and withhold. But it does so without imposing any tax. There's no tax imposed here in this chapter. None of the code sections in Chapter 24 ever impose a tax. It just goes right to the section 3402, where it says that an employer making payment of wages shall deduct and withhold. But it doesn't say there's a tax imposed. And this code section, which is what every employer will immediately tell you, or at least the informed ones, or their attorneys will immediately tell you, this is the code section that authorizes and requires the employer to withhold tax from your wages. And while it does appear to authorize them to withhold, I want to note again that in this Chapter 24, there is no tax imposed on the wages of the citizen. And remember, there was no tax imposed on the wages of the citizen in Subtitle A either. So now what we have in 1945 is a law that's created that allows the government to withhold or allows the employers, allows the government to order employers or to ask employers to withhold this tax from the wages. And uh, there's never any tax imposed. So they're creating an authority to collect, and you, the citizen, are supposed to know how to manage that tax collector when you get, encounter him in your life. Now, let's go back and look at this. Uh, quickly, uh, one last time, one additional time. The code section starts out, except as otherwise provided in this section. Every employer making payment of wages shall deduct and withhold upon such wages a tax. Okay, now the first seven words here is except as otherwise provided in this section. Now that's a clause of subordination. It means, hey, hold on, wait a minute. This might not be the final command of the law. You have to go and see what might otherwise be provided as an exception in some other code section of this code section 3402. So section 3402 creates the appearance of a requirement for the employer to collect the tax on wages, but it does so without imposing any tax and it does so only by appearance, because there is this condition, except as otherwise provided. So to find out what the true command of the statute is, we need to examine the other subsections and see what might otherwise be provided as an exception. Now, this code section, guess what, goes on for pages. A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q. I mean, this thing just goes on and on and on. And, of course, the intent is to prevent anyone from the population from examining what the exceptions might be. So that's what we're going to take a look at when we get back. We're coming up on another five-minute break here. Okay. This is 
Thomas Reed. Welcome to the TaxFreedom.com website, and we're back. We're discussing the uh, employment tax laws of Subtitle C, and we were looking at the authority to uh, collect and withhold income tax, and we were talking about uh, Chapter 24, Collection of Income Tax at Source on Wages. And the first thing that we identified about this chapter is there is no tax imposed anywhere in the chapter. Section 3401, unlike the other chapters, the first code section in the other chapters of Subtitle C, does not impose any tax. It's definitions. And Section 3402, the next code section, also does not impose any tax. It goes right to establishing an apparent authority for the employer to withhold the tax. But it does so without imposing any tax. So that leaves the wages of the citizens, both under Subtitle A and Subtitle C, without any code section that they can point to where their wages are taxed, unlike the wages of the non-resident aliens, which are specifically taxed through the use of the word wages in Subtitle A under Code Section 1441B. So 3402, as we said, the first Subsection A starts out with, except as otherwise provided in this section. Every employer making payment of wages shall deduct and withhold upon such wages a tax. That certainly sounds like they have to deduct and withhold tax, but again it says, except as otherwise provided, which is a clause of subordination or subjugation. It tells the reader that this code section may not be the actual command of the law under this code section. You need to read the other code sections. And as I pointed out, they go on forever to discourage the average reader in the population from pursuing, identifying what those possible exceptions might be. But if you take the time to read the law and get all the way down to subsection N, there's something very interesting here. And we're going to read this code section to you, or at least the first paragraph. Uh, 3402, that's uh, income tax collected at source, section N, employees incurring no income tax liability, notwithstanding any other provision of this section, an employer shall not be required to deduct and withhold any tax under this chapter upon a payment of wages to an employee if there is an effect with respect to such payment, a withholding exemption certificate furnished to the employer by the employee certifying that the employee, one, incurred no liability for income tax imposed under subtitle A for his preceding taxable year, and two, anticipates that he will incur no liability for income tax imposed under subtitle A for his current taxable year. The Secretary shall by regulations provide for the coordination of the provisions of this subsection with the provisions of subsection F, which subsection, by the way, is entitled exemptions. So the Secretary is commanded to coordinate the provisions of this subsection with those in subsection F entitled exemptions. It's tied together with the exemptions. Now, the first thing I want to point out about this code section, N, is that it starts with a supremacy clause. It says, notwithstanding any other provision of this section. That, my friends, is a supremacy clause. It means, irregardless of whatever it says anywhere else in this code section, Forget all that other stuff. This right here is the supreme and superior, the uh, command of the law. And it says an employer shall not be required to deduct and withhold any tax under this chapter. That's chapter 24, where in subsection A, the employer is authorized, and it's made apparent that he's required. But appearances can be deceiving. Because he's not required if you know what the law says. So they really aren't kidding when they tell you it's up to you to know the law because this is where they take advantage of your naivety and ignorance of the statutes. And nobody knows this stuff because, of course, what this says is that there's no withholding of tax from an employee who gives a statement to the employer certifying 
that he incurred no liability for income tax imposed under Subtitle A for his preceding taxable year and anticipates that he will incur no liability for income tax imposed under Subtitle A for his current taxable year. Now, who in the average population, who in the general population, what average guy knows what Subtitle A is? How many people in this population know whether or not they're liable by statute for tax under Subtitle A? Is this general knowledge? They're taking advantage of the fact that you don't know this stuff. But it's right here. It says, as the supreme law, irregardless of what it says, irregardless of the employer's apparent requirement, if you give your employer a statement that says you're not liable for tax under Subtitle A, he is relieved of the duty to withhold. He's not allowed to take your money. He has no legal authority to do so. You're exempted from it. But you have to give him the certification in the right form and certif certifying that you have no liability for tax under Subtitle A. Now, who was it that we identified is liable for tax in Subtitle A? Oh, that's right. It was the withholding agent. That code section was 1461. Any person required to deduct any deduct, deduct and withhold any tax under this chapter is hereby made liable for such tax. There it is. There's a code section that plainly and clearly makes a party liable for the payment of the tax that exists in Subtitle A. This is the indirect collection at the source. This is the indirect scheme of taxation that was tested and approved by the court where they said it's completely constitutional to require these people making payments to foreign persons to withhold money as tax and then to require those parties to turn the tax over to the government. And that's what the Bruchaber case was all about in the beginning. Whether or not a company, a corporation, could be compelled to perform as a tax collector. Once that was settled, they put in place this requirement to collect the tax from foreigners, and once they have the companies all performing in 1945, they take advantage of the wave of patriotic fervor, get the people to sign up for it, and they have all the employers performing for them under the duty that can be imposed there as an excise. So at 3402N says that if you certified your employer, you've incurred no that you've incurred no liability under Subtitle A, you're exempted from the withholding of the tax. So you can tell your employer you don't want the income tax to be withheld from your pay. They'll still want to take the FICA and the, uh, so forth, but they won't take the income tax if you certify it correctly. At least that's what's in the law. And there are still a few employers around the country who will invade, although most of the big institutional uh, employers today have become the de facto uh, extensions of the, the federal bureaucracy. And they uh, won't obey the law. They think that uh, it's not your money, it's the government's, and they're going to take it and give it to them no matter what the law says. But they are violating the law. They are violating their authority to withhold, which is limited to where they're given permission and allowance on a Form W-4 which is specifically entitled an Employees Withholding Allowance Certificate. And it is the mechanism provided for under Section 3402A and its implementing regulations that provide for the citizen to give the employer this permission to withhold. And the citizen is given some control over how much will be withheld by being allowed uh, to claim a number of uh, exemptions that will be used in calculating how much tax is withheld. But they're all deceived into believing that you have to allow the tax and that you're only allowed to claim the exemptions for yourself if you're single and uh, don't have any dependents. And that, uh, beyond that, you don't have any control on how much tax you will pay. And as a result, when you're young, in the beginning, you put down single and zero, and they withhold upwards of uh, you know, 30% from you. And, of course, at that age, you're not probably making a whole lot on an hourly basis, so you're going to end up being in the 15 to 17 percent tax bracket. That means you're going to be owed money at the end of the year, and that is why most people start filing a tax return. Not because they owe any tax and want to pay tax, and the law makes them and requires them, and they respect the law, and they want to do what they have to, and they want to pay for the government. That's not why people begin filing tax returns. People begin filing tax returns because they have naively and ignorantly allowed too much money to be withheld from them, and they have given the United States government a free loan of their hard-earned labors 
do until April 15th. And the government, of course, who welcomes the free loan because they don't have to pay interest on it. And as long as you allow it, there's no constitutional problem in terms of taking a private property without compensation because you've allowed it. But where you don't allow it, it becomes an issue. And uh, this tax does not properly reach you because, as you remember, in this chapter, there is no tax imposed on the wages of the citizen. Uh, citizens naively allow the tax to be withheld at a rate greater than is required when they're young. They are trained to get into the habit of filing a Form 1040, not to pay tax, but to get a refund. And then, after five, six years, lo and behold, eventually, one year, suddenly, you're not filing to get a refund anymore. Now you're filing to pay tax. But does the law require you to pay that on your wages? Is that what you know, the Supreme Court said? Is that what's in the law? No, well, that's just what you've been trained to do. And, of course, at that point, old habits are hard to break, and the government does everything to discredit any information or, or uh, authorities that contradict the de facto operation, which is as far removed at this point from a de jure application of the law as are the devil's acts removed from the Ten Commandments. So uh, that's what we are. That's what we have today. That's where we're at. We have the government unconstitutionally enforcing the tax on the earnings of the citizens without. Uh, uh, accounting for any basis, which uh, effectively uh, becomes a direct tax without apportionment as commanded under the second plank of the Communist Manifesto. And uh, the IRS appears to be more concerned with enforcing a practice of that philosophy than it is concerned with properly exercising the authorities that are granted under the written law to enforce the indirect tax that was constitutionally upheld in 1916 by the Supreme Court. And there are no intervening authorities between now and those cases in 1916. If you call the IRS and ask them, why is this tax constitutional, they will refer you to that Bruce case and the Baltic mining case that I've been quoting extensively the last few weeks here in this analysis. So, uh, you know, that's going to take us to a discussion next week, or at least we're going to start the discussion next week, on what's wrong with this system of graduated tax brackets. Because one of our Supreme Court justices long ago wrote about that, and I think it's very interesting and pertains to the situation we have today. And uh, that's the topic that I'm going to take up next, I think. So uh, I'm not sure. We don't have much time left here, a couple of minutes. Uh, my name is Thomas Freed. I've been doing this lecture on uh, the income tax and its constitutional application under the written law, and we're going to continue doing that. I'm the author of The Simple Truth About Income Tax, which is available uh, self self-published uh, through iUniverse. You can get to it through the iUniverse website. It's The Simple Truth About Income Tax by Thomas Freed. And I'm also the webmaster for the taxfreedom.com website. That's tax-freedom, there's a hyphen in there, taxfreedom.com, where most of the information that I'm going through in this lecture series is posted in articles that you can download and read. And I'm also the webmaster for the IRSZoom.com website where any person can get help answering IRS letters for $30 or less. And that's going to close the program for this week. Hope you're enjoying the lecture series. We'll see you next week. This is Thomas Freed signing off for the Truth Attack Hour on the Liberty Works Radio Network.